Good evening. Welcome to the 19th Las Vegas Book Festival Virtual Book Week. My name is Allie Haynes Hamblin. I'm a member of the Literary and Programming Committee for this year's first ever online Las Vegas Book Festival. Thank you so much for joining us for this virtual book week. The Las Vegas Book Festival is produced by the City of Las Vegas and Nevada Humanities. We couldn't make this festival happen without the generous support of our sponsors, and we'd like to thank them for their support. The Las Vegas Review Journal, 98.5 KLUC, NBC Channel 3, the Mayor's Fund for Las Vegas Life, Nevada Center for the Book, Nevada State Library Archives and Public Records, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. <clears throat> the Las Vegas Book Festival is supported in part by an award from the National Endowment for the Arts. And now I am pleased to moderate how to put on a book festival featuring the members of our literary and programming committee. Welcome everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. So why don't we start with just a round robin of introducing ourselves. Um, and I will, uh, since we're all on this uh, online platform, I'll just call on you so we don't jump all over each other. So Scott, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, my name is Scott Dickensheets. I am the deputy editor of Desert Companion. It's the uh, magazine of Nevada Public Radio. And before that, I was an editor for various local alt-weeklies and in addition, I've edited a number of, uh, or co-edited a number of books for the uh, Las Vegas Rights series put on by the city and um, and the Nevada Humanities Committee. It's an annual uh, series of books showcasing the best writers in town. So that's my story. Awesome, thank you. Jeff. Uh, my name is Jeff Schumacher. I am the Vice President of Exhibits and Programs at the Mob Museum. Been doing that for a while, but before that, I was a journalist here in Las Vegas for about 25 years at the Las Vegas Sun, Las Vegas Review Journal, as well as some alt weeklies that no longer exist, like Las Vegas City Life and Las Vegas Mercury. I've written a couple of books, so works of history about Las Vegas, and uh, I've been involved with, and also was involved with the Las Vegas Rights Project that Scott described. Um, I've uh, been involved with the book festival really since the first festival. So 19 years, not every year was I involved, but probably 14 out of those 19 years I've had some role. So very pleased to uh, be here. That's awesome. Thank you. Bobby Ann. Hello, I'm Bobby Ann Howell. I'm the program wrangler for Nevada Humanities, which is your state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And of course, we love all things in literature and culture and history and civic engagement. And we have offices here in Las Vegas and in Reno. We work statewide and we've been a founding sponsor of the book festival and have been so fortunate to work with many great sponsors like the city and the library district and the review journal and the great community that makes this festival happen. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you. Nikki. Hi guys, my name's Nikki Bailina Streets and I am an elementary school librarian here in Clark County. It's actually my 17th year serving as an elementary school librarian and 20th year in the Clark County School District. And I have been a faithful volunteer for the book festival for many, many years. Awesome, that's extraordinary. Corey. Hi, uh, my name is Corey Goble. I'm a senior cultural specialist with the City of Las Vegas Office of Cultural Affairs. Um, I have a theater and arts education background, so I handle um, quite a few arts education programming classes, that kind of thing. Um, I've been, I think this is my fifth book festival. Um, so uh, I also handle um, some of the school visits uh, for the festival as well as the children and family programming and volunteers and logistics um, and anything else pretty much that comes up, so. <laughs> That's awesome, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am the director of the Office of Cultural Affairs for the city of Las Vegas. I have the great fortune of working with Corey every day um, and have really loved being uh, involved in this book festival since I first moved to Las Vegas in 2017. So thank you all so much for giving us your time. And um, I'd like to 
kind of just start off with, you know, we get a lot of questions about the book festival and how do we come up with these ideas and how do we pick the authors that we pick and why don't we pick the authors that we don't pick and whatnot. So I kind of just wanted to start out with um, just kind of that first question of how do you guys generate your ideas each year, year after year for the book festival and who, what, do you start with topics that you want to address or do you start with authors that you'd like to feature? I'll go ahead and start first. I'm the newbie on the committee. So I was one of those people that always asked that question, like, how do you get these people? And being an elementary school librarian, I really wanted to try to put in some suggestions for the committee since I work with the kids that would be attending the festival. So it all starts with a wish list. It really starts with like, if you could have anybody, who would you have? And that's where it starts. And you go from there. Yeah, and I'll I'll sort of add on to that as well. Um, it's I would say that literary arts um, is not necessarily my forte, right? So um, I'm always, always, always looking for suggestions from the community, um, and specifically with Nikki, um, we've been able to work together to really create that that wish list and kind of round it out. Um, it's kind of intimidating to start um, and say, "Oh my goodness, how are we going to do this?" Um, especially when um, it's not something that I have a whole lot of experience with, but that's almost in a way a little bit kind of freeing because then you do get to kind of, you know, have this, this in a perfect world, if everything lines up, um, you know, who could we get and, and, you know, you can reach out to these authors and their agents and not really, not really be able to say no, that that's not possible before you kind of start. So as it starts to shape up, you get these, you know, this experience doing, um, you know, reaching out to these authors and these agents and um, really shaping something that is not necessarily something that is uh, what you expected from from the get go. But it's it's kind of great to be able to use that inexperience as almost as a strength rather than a weakness. So um, it's nice to to kind of discover all these new um, new areas of, of focus and enthusiasm, um, um, you know, around the, the country. So it's really nice. Um, I'll just add also, sorry, Scott, uh, that this is just a small portion that you see here of the people who work on this literary committee. And over the years, we have had input from many uh, people who work at UNLV, on the journalism and English, and history, culture, all different departments, uh, UNR, CSN, um, the Writer's Block Bookstore. So we do have a wide reach of just looking who's out there, um, particularly Nevada Humanities likes to make sure that Nevada authors across our state um, uh, are part of the book festival so we can showcase the great talent that we have in Nevada, as well as working with the committee to bring in authors uh, from around the nation that uh, may have interesting and compelling works, topics that are out there. It's uh, really all year long I'm compiling lists or I might see someone uh, present their book or, you know, look at the, the listing of the favorite books of Latino poetry. And then I'll pull all that up and make sure I have that list of authors um, just because I want to try to get as broad a reach as possible when it's time for us to pull the book festival together. So that's just a little bit of, of the process for me. Thanks. In my case, it's, it's kind of a mix of both. I I specialize mostly in nonfiction programming, and so I keep an, I keep my eye on the what's happening in the world, trying to to bind both a combination of of panels that would address like immediate topics of of current event natures, current events nature, but also more enduring kinds of of uh, subjects as well. And then you try and find a mix of local and out of state writers, people who you know who whom the community could benefit from hearing from. And then you just keep reaching out, you try and get a diversity of of, uh, of thoughts and people and, and bring them in and get them talking. Um, I, I think Scott and I uh, look at this similarly and we've been involved with this for a while. And so there's, there's kind of two uh, related things, right? There's, um, there's themes like what, what are the important topics in literature right now? 
what are the important topics in the world right now? And can, is it realistic that we could put together a panel, for example, of authors um, who could come to our festival and who could interact you know, effectively to elicit interesting dialogue? Um, the other uh, direction is you discover, you're discovering new authors. You're like, oh, you know, if you're a reader and you're keeping track of, let's say, uh, uh, Southwestern literature or, you know, uh, nonfiction related to a particular type of history, whether it's Nevada history or whatever, um, you know, you want certain authors to be presented because you're, you feel like you want the, there to be greater exposure for that, that individual. And so you look for ways to, to bring that person in. Um, and, and, you know, it's not easy because, and we'll get into this, but I mean, they're not, the, not all the schedules all work together. You know, sometimes you really want somebody and they can't come or they won't come um, or you can't afford to bring them. And, uh, you know, so you have to work around that. But for me, I, I prefer start starting with themes and then, and then trying to find the right people to fit those themes. I also forgot to mention, um, and, and Mal, Ali will probably talk about it, that the book festival has components that are for children, for young adults, for all different types of genres that we try to look for um, to have it really, uh, we really want to build curiosity and engagement in reading in, in every way that we can. So it's also a, a big part of the topic as we start looking at what's possible and, and what we, we want to have. Nice. Well, yeah, that's, I, I'm glad that you brought that up, Bobby Ann, because I was thinking too that I think one of the things that I like to um, try to pay a lot of attention to is what are the connections to the literary and the literature world that we have in other aspects of our arts community or in just the culture of our community in general. Um, I know like last year we brought in the Nevada Museum of Art to speak about how they create catalogs and publish catalogs based on their visual art exhibitions. Um, so I, I, I really like bringing up things that are, um, that people wouldn't automatically assume are connected to the written word. But then when you think about it, it's like, well, yeah, songwriting is part of the written word and poetry as we, you know, thanks to Bobby Ann, we always have a huge presence of uh, poetry and poets in the book festival. Um, and I think the, and please correct me if I'm wrong for those of you who have been around a lot longer than I have, but I believe that the Vegas Valley Comic Book Festival was uh, born from the Las Vegas Book Festival and yes. eventually peeled off to be its own uh, separate event, which is, to me, that's really exciting. And that's the sign of a really fantastic festival when it bursts new festivals from it. That is true. That is how it happened. That's awesome. That's awesome. So can you guys um, can you guys talk to us a little bit about um, you know when you are reaching out to authors and you know talking about different you know topics for the book festival you know how how do you how do you approach how do you approach authors and invite them to come participate in a book festival in Las Vegas of all places which is uh, we're changing that but it's not currently known necessarily as a literature mecca. But it is known as a fun mecca, and so <laughs> that that can be of immense value in trying to lure someone here. Uh, but mostly, I just reach out with a certain, you know, modesty and say, "Look, we have a book festival. We think you'd be an important part of it. Uh, we think your work speaks to some theme or some moment that that we're trying to uh, explicate." So, um, and most writers are. You know they've been they've been through this before, and they know how to handle it. They're receptive. They might tell you, you know, here's my price. Can you meet it? And we can or we can't. But, um, but really, it's just like dealing with almost anyone else you'd have to deal with, except, um, you know, the subject is books, which you, which I love and they love, and so you have that sort of, you know, mutual common ground to begin with, and that I think that really helps. Um, I would add. I would add to that that I think one of the uh, the most successful ways to approach a writer uh, like that is if you know their work, right? I mean, it's not some you know a random person contacting them. It's somebody who's read uh, their book or or is familiar with their you know who they are and and what they're trying to say. And 
I, I I've always strived to to uh, you know I don't want to invite somebody just because I saw their name on a list. I I, I want to understand who they are and 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 how they would fit into our festival. And and you I think a, a writer in particular is going to be pretty perceptive if he receives he or she receives an email, and it looks like a publicity thing uh, or it looks like a genuine you know uh, invitation. You know. I think we're. We're also very lucky because a lot of the people we work with on this committee and the people who can't be on the committee who help us provide introductions to, to address just what Jeff is talking about. They may know someone um, and can help us uh, just have that conversation with them. I know a few years back, uh, Claire Vay Watkins was was coming up and she had said yes and then she won a big prize and we said please go do that take your big prize and just remember us when after you're famous uh, to come back to us which she did right because we'd already kind of had a conversation and she's been a part of uh, our festival numerous times and a big part of our community um, so those are really great for those conversations to happen when uh, especially for us at Maddie Humanities when Nevada authors have works coming out, we definitely want to know about it and learn about it and uh, try to find ways to, to get that word out across our state through all our literary programs. And sometimes we get to do interesting things. Um, the Pulitzer Prize uh, oh, um, company did um, their centennial of things, so we got extra money to specifically reach out to Pulitzer Prize authors and we were able to at that time to do a panel with the Las Vegas Sun. And so those all those authors and writers who had connections to Nevada but had left our state were able to come back, talk about the work that they important work that they did at the, the Las Vegas Sun and, and its ramifications and the laws that were created for construction safety here in Las Vegas. And you know, you get those really honored times to bring people together and meet people uh, talking about important topics that are to our community. So that's just a, another element. So that brings up um, a really great segue to the next question that I wanted to pose to the group. Um, and Bobby Ann, that was, you know, how important is it to you guys as you're strategizing and brainstorming and planning that we feature local Las Vegas authors versus casting a wide net for authors nationwide or even internationally? Well, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Scott. Well, no, that was me, but if, if it's okay, uh, <laughs> over, the, over the last few years, that has been my primary focus is uh, local topics, local authors. Um, and, and we have a lot of them, you know, and it's really cool when you can, uh, you, you almost discover somebody you didn't know was out there and bring them into the book festival. And it, and in a sense, then it brings them into the, the local literary community. And, you know, we have two point, what, 2.2, 2.3 million people in our metropolitan area. And there's a lot more writers than we know about just because they're not part of the, the in crowd down on main street or whatever. Uh, you know, they, they're out there. And if we learn about their books and we can expose them at the festival, I think that's what it's really all about. My focus is on the viewer or the, you know, the, the, the attendee. And so if I think a, I, I like to, I like to work local writers into the mix because I know a lot of them and I, I want their work to be seen, but I also want to deliver the most of that I can for, the person who's going to come and plot themselves in front of this panel. And so if depending on the theme or the topic mm -hmm. or whatever, that often means bringing in somebody from, you know, from elsewhere, which I think is good. I think it's good to introduce those people to, to our, our people and introduce our city to them. And, um, and I think that's mutually beneficial. And I think it helps the bloodstream overall. Uh, it, you know, to have these visiting writers get an appreciation for what this town really is, as opposed to what they've read about. What I love about having local authors is that being the elementary school librarian, I often get to host many of these authors at my schools and bring them to the kids that they're writing for. And it's so fun when you get to make that connection that this author actually lives 
just right down the street from where our school is. Last year, we were really fortunate to host Daria Peoples Riley, and she's local and doing amazing, great things. And being a woman of color, too, it's so important for these kids to see um, these talented authors and illustrators represented. Um, a few years ago, I hosted Lindsay Levitt that grew up in Las Vegas. She's not currently local, but what a treat that she and I had the same fifth grade teachers because I'm born and raised in Vegas. And that was fun for the kids to hear that a famous author that's six successful actually has ties to their own town. So it's great to have um, visiting authors from other places that are far because you can make it a big deal like they came all the way from such and such. But it's also lovely to host people that are here and living in our own community. And we really strive for that mix. Um, we want good content, uh, interesting content. We want, I, I know, getting people to read and be curious about reading is really important and discovering new authors. Um, Benjamin Sines uh, was at a school visit, uh, the poet, and he was like a rock star to those fifth graders. Um, and uh, I, uh, Martina Spada was, came uh, from New York City. It was a long plane ride for him, and he was really tired. But when he got to the high schools where we took him, he was wonderful, and the kids just loved him. And uh, he, when he was leaving, he said, I know I felt tired. He said, but that was a great experience at that school. And those are just things that, you know, it just, you hope it happens. Our, our poetry workshop with the veterans with Brian Turner a few years back is still one of my all time favorite experiences. So those are the things we also want to try to provide to our communities with all the authors we bring in, local, regional, and nationally. Yeah, it's always um, it's really great because, uh, like Nikki said, I'm I'm also usually working with authors doing things in local schools, and so it's really nice to see, um, you know, if they're local, that they they have a little bit more enthusiasm and a little bit more um, kind of pep in their step when they when they do it because they know how important it is, um, especially with this community who I think has a general sort of we're sort of set apart. We're almost sort of the redheaded stepchild of cities, right? You know, we, we, we do things a little bit differently here. And so, you know, it's really important for us that the kids see that their trajectory can go, you know, beyond here, beyond um, what they might, you know, assume that their, um, you know, that their lives are going to be like or whatnot. So it's really nice to um, have an author who um, understands the importance of, you know, starting as young as possible with this love and appetite for literacy and reading and stuff and it's e just even more um special when they are when they are local and they recognize that you know this is this is especially important i i guess i would i would add one more thing um about this um i i talk we're talking about local authors and I also think local topics, and this sounds like something obvious, but um, talking about Las Vegas, you know, you mentioned that it's a kind of a, an unusual city, and, and it is, uh, and, and, it, and it generates a lot of dialogue about what kind of city are we, what kind of city do we want to be, um, and it's great fodder for you know, for authors and uh, and for discussions, and the some of the best panels I've I've witnessed or been involved in at the book festival over the years have been discussions of the history of Las Vegas and discussions about you know what kind of a place is this and how has it been wrongly portrayed or uh, has it been correctly portrayed? Um, how can we make it better? What do people misunderstand about the city and so forth? And and uh, you know authors and right you know writers uh, especially not fiction and nonfiction uh, have really shown some great uh, ability to understand the city in a, in a deeper way and so hearing from them is always good and that's a big part of the Las Vegas rights project that yeah. Jeff and Scott edited and curated for 10 years that this year was curated and edited by Jared Key they all are authors writing uh, loosely around a theme that connects to Las Vegas and the just so many variations, and um, you can look at all the past authors on that at the Las Vegas Rights webpage at Nevada Humanities. It's pretty awesome.
Awesome. So thank you all so much. I'm sorry I've had a couple of technical difficulties during that last roundabout, but I appreciate um, I appreciate you guys uh, keeping it going. So, you know, one of the things, obviously, that's the most different about this year's festival is that this is the first time that the book festival has gone totally online and everything will be virtual. But we're not the only one. You know, I know the Tucson mm -hmm. Festival of Books and the National Book Show, they, they just, or sorry, the National Book Festival, they have both gone virtual. I think the LA Times Festival of Books also was virtual this year. Um, and I know that some of you uh, annually visit some of those other book festivals, but, but now that they're available online, um, I'm curious to know, you know, how often you're checking out these other book festivals and how much inspiration you get from the sessions and the authors that you see at other book festivals, how much inspiration impacts what you are then brainstorming for the Las Vegas Book Festival later on. I'm a frequent attendee at these online virtual book festivals <laughs> because I've gone traditionally to the Tucson um, uh, Festival of Books and the LA one. I've always wanted to go to the National Book Festival, but it's always right around when school starts and that being a school librarian, it makes it a little bit impossible to attend. But I was able to attend a few sessions and I thought it was fantastic. I mean, obviously it's not the same as being in person, but you still get to feel connected and a part of it. And so um, one of my favorite sessions that I've attended uh, virtually was through the Tucson Festival of Books. And I got to meet Kevin Kwan, the author of the Crazy Rich Asian series. And he was delightful. He was funny. And I felt like I was there in the room talking to him. So it gives me great hope that if we are um, entering this new virtual world, we can make great things happen. Um, earlier this year, I was able to host uh, author and illustrator, actually Caldecott honor uh, illustrator, Tony Dieterlizzi through the Unlikely Story, which is owned by Jeff Kinney, the author of Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And it was fantastic. We had like 384 kids attend the virtual session, and then they were able to purchase books um, signed by the author. And I thought it was a really beautiful thing. I was skeptical at first because I didn't know how it would go over, but I've never seen kids so excited virtually. You know what I mean? Like I was getting emails and Google Meet Hangouts. That was so fun, Mrs. Street. So just making that passion and enthusiasm for literature still happen, even though we can't physically bring these people to them. I think that's wonderful. Um, I guess I can go, uh, Scott, you probably have some thoughts on this too. Uh, we, I, I, we've attended the Los Angeles times festival of books, I think what 13 straight years. Um, and you know, it's a great experience in person. Um, I'm, I'm going to check out some of that this year, uh, virtually, and I'll be very curious to see how, how it translates. Um, I, I will say though, that, you know, I think there's a lot of virtual conversations, with authors right now, and and they all are doing a great job. The, the ones I've seen, and uh, with uh, connecting, you know, with people, um, I, I I think it it can work. You know, what you don't get is the ability to, uh, you know, say hi to the author after the panel and and get your book inscribed as opposed to just signed. But other than that, uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of upside to it. <clears throat> Well, I appreciate your confidence that I that I would have a thought on this, Jeff. Um, <laughs> I'm not. I have no uh, idea. <laughs> as it happens, I talked th this week or last week to a psychology professor who was describing for me the way the brain still is not yet. Our brains are not yet adapted to this form of communication, and so it's, the brains have it has a hard time like predicting the unpredictable lag times that come with Wi-Fi connections and so on, as opposed to the instantaneous understanding of, um, of, of person to person. And so it, that contributes to what he calls Zoom fatigue. And I experience some of that when I'm watching a lot of, uh, a lot of online literary discussions. I think they lack a little bit of the spontaneity that you come to expect from in-person panels in which is, very often the most, you know, sort of intensely enjoyable part of those panels. Um, at the same time, this is where we are, and I think we can make it work. It's just, you know, 
all of us getting used to this new thing being as prevalent as it is. Scott, are you are, are you able to remember the, the to tell the story of Christopher Hitchens? Uh, he he. We went to the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books some years ago. Christopher Hitchens has passed away now, but you know, very very snarky, quick witted uh, British author, well American in the end. But he, uh, the, what you're going to miss with something like this, like a, a call like this, is the type of interplay that he had with some. Uh, audience members back at the book festival. You remember how that went? Yeah, one of them stood up to the microphone and said, when are you going to tell the truth about 9-11? And I don't remember exactly what he said, but he put the guy in his place in about 10 seconds. And it was a brilliant bit of repartee that, you know, um, and, and it's sort of a memorable moment that you just, you know, you sacrifice that in this format. But, you know, it, that's just the way, that's where we are. It's kind of part of that unpredictability that, you know, you referenced, you know, that when you're in person, you know, things happen, right? And then you just kind of, and, you, and little side dialogues that you can witness uh, that, that you don't get with this, with this format. Yeah, when you're per when you're face to face, you definitely miss some of that charm, like those moments that you talked about, um, being at the LA Book Festival. I did say after my first virtual author assembly, I was like, that was the quietest assembly I have ever been to, because <laughs> all the kids were on mute, right? They couldn't interact necessarily. We had some. Um, questions that we had taken from students previous to the author assembly, but they weren't able to ask them on the format that we were using. So it lacks that little bit of charm. But like I said, I'm hopeful because I have to be elementary school. We're all about growth mindset. Like we're going to make this happen. We're going to make it work. And however, however unusual it is for me, I keep in mind that, you know, generation selfie is probably, you know, coming up behind me is, is more adaptable to this format than than an old goat like me. Well, and we have been able to bring in a black audience just because they didn't have to actually physically travel. They can come right. in from wherever they're at. We've done been doing a lot of online programming at Nevada Humanities. So our salon series and our poetry series have just we've had people from across the country be able to join in. Um, so there's that added component that we didn't have in person. So I think we're all trying to look at all the the pluses and minuses and learn about the whole thing and still stay engaged. I know my for myself when I log into uh, another, um, I was listening to the BMI uh, 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 poet uh, last night and to, I you know set my alarm, turned everything off and tried to give it the tension that I would if I had gone there in person to sit down. And that's that's my challenge with the, this format is that I want that attention. I want to try to give the speaker that same attention and um, not think of it as the screen that has been as part of our lives, right? The TV screen where we do all kinds of things while the TV's on and can stop it or change channels, but to, to think of it as those people that I want to hear. And so that's my challenge. Yeah, I think turning turning obstacles into opportunities, right, is kind of what we are all becoming very well versed in, not just with this fest festival, but just our everyday life, right? But uh, I do think that, especially with the uh, author visits in schools, there's a lot of logistics that goes into that, right? And there's uh, oftentimes multiple additional hotel days and other, you know, expenses that get added onto a, an author visit. So uh, we are very excited that you know, they're going to get a different virtual author visit uh, in the schools, right? But it's going to be, you know, I wonder if the difference between standing on an auditorium stage addressing 300 kids versus addressing that same similar amount of kids from the comfort of your living room or your writing room or something like that as an author, it's different. And in some ways, I think you get a little bit more of an insight into the author and their process and things like that. So, you know, trying to figure out where the opportunity lies in, you know, as Bobby Ann had mentioned, getting somebody who can participate who wouldn't be able to otherwise for travel reasons or whatnot. Um, I think we've been pretty, we've learned a lot in terms of identifying those opportunities and uh, it's challenging, but I think especially now as some of these visits are starting to happen and things like that, we're starting to see that, you know, maybe it's not as as big of a drawback as we initially thought. So uh, that's, that's always nice to, 
to uh, to be able to turn, like I said, those op those obstacles into opportunities. And I think all of us in programming, programming uh, elements that we've learned in this as part of this crisis are things that are going to stay with us. And then I, I hope that we still have online programming festival, and that I'll always be making our exhibits online as well as in person. So I think, you know, we've learned a lot that we'll continue to use. For me, the biggest challenge, oddly enough, is scheduling. In the old format, if a writer accepted, then his schedule was, his availability was assured. In this format, you know, three writers say, yeah, I'll participate. And then trying to get them all to land on the same hour and a half uh, is, you know, it's like trying to corral my dogs all in the same place at one time. And it's just, that's proving more challenging than I anticipated it would be. Yeah, seems simple enough, right? But uh, yeah, I think <laughs> everybody's everybody's trying to integrate one hour into their week as opposed to taking off two days and coming to Vegas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, what we've noticed at the museum and, yeah. and even with uh, uh, with other things is time zone uh, people inability to uh, understand time zones. <laughs> I would recommend anybody who schedules to make doubly sure people understand what time zone they're in and how many there are in the continent. Kind of important. <laughs> yep. Very good point. <laughs> yes, that's an excellent point. Well, and I was going to say too, you know, thinking about, you know, the event and, you know, and the authors participating, but also the viewership and, you know, going forward, I, I also can foresee that we'll continue to have some sort of an online virtual element because with putting the festival online like this, anybody in the world can attend the book festival, yeah. now, whether mm -hmm. you've got the budget to travel to Las Vegas or not. And so, you know, I foresee that this can really help expand the audience for who visits the book festival and who is aware that Las Vegas has a book festival. And so going forward, you know, we'll have to continue to put much of the content online, even when we're able to go back to doing a live in-person book festival um, to, you know, continue to serve that audience that has become aware of you that is now going to look online in future years for future book festival iterations. And that's, that is and that's one of the, one of the major upsides to this for me is that there'll be now a, a continuing ongoing record. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Jeff managed to get, you know, C-SPAN's book TV to come to the, to uh, check out some of our events. Uh, but otherwise, it's, you know, we don't have sort of this ongoing record of the, the really the rich programming that we've had for year after year. And so I'm hoping that this, you know, this changes that. Talking about turning a, a, a challenge into an opportunity, I think that's really one of the, one of the major upsides. So for, um, you know, I think all of us, I think I probably have the shortest history with this book festival of the group. So for all of you that have, you know, long histories of, a, you know, decade or more, what would you say has been some of your favorite moments of past book fest, of past Las Vegas book festivals? <laughs> wow. And it could be your favorite because it was a hilarious gaff or because it was a real high point that hit you emotionally or... You know, favorite is a very highly subjective word. <laughs> well, oh, go I, ahead. I was going to say, I've got three right off the top of my head. So as a, I have three. As a school librarian, my favorite moment was bringing Nathan Hale. Um, he's a graphic novelist to one of my schools. It was fantastic. If you've never seen him present before, he, he draws in real time and he gives you the, the the craziest stories from history. I've never really been a history fanatic, but he makes me want to learn everything about American history. Uh, he taught my kids just this crazy story about Lewis and Clark and how if you take a metal detector, you can still find their poop trails all over the place. Even the PE teacher at my school was enthralled in this author assembly. And I'll be quite honest, my school could not afford to bring him to to our kids. It was just too expensive. He was out of our reach. But when he teamed up with the book festival, it made it more accessible for us. And so that was a huge blessing. 
Um, as an adult, as a reader myself, I loved meeting Colson Whitehead. What a joy that was. I think he's so intellectual and intriguing. Um, I loved having my copy of the Underground Railroad signed by him. Like, what a treasure to have. Um, and then, like, the dorky girl in me got to meet Lisa Loeb last year, or I think that was two years ago. She came as um, a children's singer. But, you know, the 90s girl in me was super geeking out about meeting Lisa Loeb. So those are, like, three of my highlights from the Las Vegas Book Festival. Oh, I have so many. And one of the things that just before I forget it is this festival is put on by a group of people. A lot of festivals are their own organization, but this festival is put on by the passion of this community who wants to bring authors and literature to light in this community. So from the library district to the city of Las Vegas, to the city of Henderson, to the Review Journal, to KNPR, to the universities, all, all these people have come together. So my favorite aspect of it is the work that comes together every month as a community coming together to provide something for uh, the rest of us. And that's always been a big component of the festival to me. Um, I mentioned Brian Turner earlier. He's a, uh, a poet, a soldier poet, and he came and did a workshop with us at the Veterans Center specifically for veterans. And it was fantastic. Even now when I think about it, it just he just brought to life some people who never talked about things and gave them a forum to maybe write and think about things they hadn't been able to address. It also enlightened me that every soldier has the person that they are. So he talks a lot about the view of the poet and the view of the soldier and how they come together. And that was a great moment. Um, uh, the Pulitzer Prize moment was wonderful. The, the politics and pop culture the conversation a couple years ago, which I thought who will be interested was quite lively and interesting and so many young people were at it that that was inspiring so i have a lot of great uh and i love ch children's authors so who stole my hat is one of my favorite books so i, I always love meeting that author so just a few of many years uh i think i don't know back when it was in henderson it first started i was working for the arts council and worked for the the book festival then so i don't know what 18 years of it, so I still love it. And of course, poetry, yeah. poetry rocks. The Spark Youth Poetry um, Program is part of the book festival, and many of those young people bravely get up and share their own work in front of an audience, and it's always amazing. And uh, so I, I thank their teachers and those students for, for sharing themselves with us um, at a place where there's also famous authors. Thanks so much. Scott, why don't you go and then I'll follow. <laughs> uh, if I had to pick a favorite, it would probably go back to 2013 or 2014 when I put together a panel on essays. And I had uh, Leslie Jameson, Dinah Lenny, and a, a GQ writer named Andrew Corsello. And they, they were all familiar with each other's stuff. They were all super bright. And they interacted with each other with such energy and intelligence that it just like blew your hair right back. It was a, it was a really great moment uh, for me to be sitting in the audience. Uh, two years ago, in the same the same festival that held the politics and pop culture uh, panel, one of those panelists was poet Hanif Abdurraqib, who also did a, a a poetry session. And man, was that amazing! I mean, that just that just knocked you over too. And I guess maybe a few years ago, we had uh, the novelist Walter Kern, and he was in conversation with New York Times book critic Dwight Garner. Was and they, those two guys go back a long way. And so they had, there was no moderator, just those two swapping stories and e exhibiting that sort of like high level literary camaraderie that was, you know, that was really super appealing. So those are three pretty good highlights for me. For me, it's weird what is what comes to mind because um, 
I, I know that I have memories of uh, somewhere in there of some smaller smaller uh, panel discussions that were memorable. But the, the ones that come to my mind right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, uh, one of the earliest uh, keynote speakers we ever had was Walter Mosley. And, uh, you know, the great writer, uh, fiction and nonfiction. And I believe he, he spoke at, uh, at Samstown. Is that correct? I think that's right. And I think so. uh, is that right? Yeah. It was just such a weird venue, you know, for, for the book festival. But uh, it was Walter Mosley. I mean, a huge writer, and we landed him, and that was a, that was a good talk by him. Uh, I'm also thinking about venues. So another keynoter we had some years ago was Chuck Palahniuk, and he spoke at UNLV, as I recall, in the student union. And uh, and the thing about that was, you know, he's an entertainer. I mean, he was definitely somebody who put on a show, but. That I think that was the most enthusiastic audience I've ever seen for a book festival event. And I mean, the, the place was packed. It was over full. And, and he put on his, you know, the usual show with his very popular writer. Um, and, and then the third one, and uh, Scott will chuckle at this probably, but uh, Chuck Klosterman, we had him come and he's the, uh, the nonfiction writer, music writer, and other now moved on to other things, novelist. Uh, but I believe the venue where he spoke was the uh, El Cortez. <laughs> so it's I, think I get for some reason I'm remembering these odd venues as the uh, as the highlights. <laughs> so I haven't been around um, nearly as long, but um, I, I think I said earlier this is I think my fifth festival. Um, and it's really different every time, not only like the physical layout, but um, you know, the focuses, the themes, it's all pretty different. And I think we, you know, we carry over the things that we know worked really well, but I think uh, more so than other festivals and other events that we do every year, I think this one, we really, we sort of start relatively fresh every time and we sort of build up from there. So it's always great to me to see how different this festival is from the year before, right? And, uh, you know, the starting to see and get relationships with people who come every year who are just so excited to see, you know, people that they are familiar with, people who they aren't familiar with. Um, it's really just great to learn quite a lot about, as I mentioned, you know, a, a media that I am not super familiar with. Um, and so it's really just fantastic just to kind of see the community reacting each and every year to, you know, our version of the book festival this year. So it's, it's, it's great. Every year it's always new and exciting. That's awesome, Corey. I would say, you know, for me as um, the the total newcomer to this group, you know, this is, I think, my third book festival, um, third or fourth. I'm starting to lose count already. But um, <laughs> really, I love watching the audience. And that's, you know, probably because of my, you know, experience in the performing arts. But really, I have had so much joy just walking through the festival and just watching the crowds, sitting under the tents, listening to the panelists, watching the illustrators, you know, seeing the kids listen to the readings. Um, and then, and really kind of walking through the courtyard and overhearing conversations as people are swapping notes and showing each other their, um, the products of their workshops from, you know, the Nata Humanities tent always has great hands-on workshops. And I see people recognizing them, you know, in other people's hands, like, oh, did you get to do the haiku station? And did you get to see the typesetter guy? And, you know, I, to me, that's the best part of the book festival. Um, and I will say one, um, one, specific highlight that really sticks out for me is um, the when we had the author of uh, Lemony Snicket, I think his name is Daniel Handler, um, a couple of years ago. Um, that was just really um, fun and special for me uh, because I had a close friend who lives in San Francisco who goes to the same um, temple as him and has known him his whole life. And so she gave me a lot of like background about you know what he was like as a kid growing up and so it's just kind of fun to have that connection between what we're doing here in las vegas and um you know some of the personal background in san francisco that's a cool story ali and i'm jealous <laughs> <laughs> well i always feel lucky i got to 
meet so many people. Um, I got to talk to Luis Urea for like a half an hour uh, before his talk, which is always special, um, you know, and especially uh, uh, immigration and all of that, all of his words are just are right with him and, and his stories. And people want to know about that experience. I think, well, you might want to read The Devil's Highway if you know what it's really like. But be ready because it's it's the truth. It's hard. And so those are those things that you would never have expected, but just a gift uh, from it. And I am going to miss desperately our journal workshop, which was going to be that I love you postcards this year. So I'll try to figure out a virtual way to do that, um, but uh, it's always great. Yeah. Well, and I will also say that I really um, have very much enjoyed, you know, our meetings with this committee, uh, going through the planning process and hearing your ideas and brainstorming with the group and talking about different authors and different topics. You know, I think one of the things that I really love is when we all you know, talk about a particular topic that we'd love to feature and then, you know, put our heads together to try to brainstorm, you know, how can we pull together an amazing panel? Um, you know, this year having two panels on uh, talking about homelessness in Southern Nevada is really, it's very topical, but it's also really, for me, very exciting and gratifying because I think that that's something that's been, you know, in my experience, two years in the making of really putting together some high quality conversations around some of the most pressing issues pressing issues in our community. So that's wonderful. I think that's so one of my favorite have... things about being on. Oh, I'm sorry, Allie. I think that's one of my favorite things about our meetings too, is that we all come to this with like our own separate passions. Like we're very passionate about the book festival, but we all have our own little niche that we're very passionate about. And I think that's been really cool. Definitely. Well, and in that vein, I really would, um, you know, want to thank Bobby Ann for mentioning that there are other members of this committee that were not able to join us today, specifically um, Erica Vital Lazar from the College of Southern Nevada, and um, Todd Witcher from UNLV, and um, uh, Demetria Giles from the Ninth Bridger School, uh, and you know, and others that have contributed um, in a less formal way, but no less uh, important way. Um, we're it's really a wonderful committee and I'm so grateful to all of you for everything that you've done to help us once again, pull off a really fantastic book festival. Does anybody have any uh, final thoughts they want to share? Just tell all your friends and visit it <laughs> read, and visit your local bookstore. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. The gentlemen from the Writer's Block have been longtime supporters of the book festival. So, you know, specifically, we'd love to see folks support independent bookstores. Um, and Poetry and this, Rock. This, yeah. Sorry, yes, Bobby. It's time, <laughs> to, get, it's time right. to get books for Christmas, right? Uh, I think also in this pandemic, you can see how important reading stories connecting with people through that medium and about those things has also been especially important. So we're hoping that the community at large um, notes that uh, and uh, keeps enjoying it. Good work. Definitely. Yep. And I know it's like a Sophie's choice to say, which session are you most looking forward to this year? So. I won't put anybody on the spot and make you pull out a single session here because they're all fantastic. <laughs> but this uh, this particular session will be airing on Monday night. So as we're um, broadcasting, it'll be Monday night. And I hope everybody will look forward to the rest of the week of really amazing, awesome programming. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> and people will be able to visit um, the different sessions, you know, like in the real festival, you have to choose mm -hmm. go to. So I believe in this one that it'll be online for a while, those recorded ones. So you can go to them all. Yeah. That's right. That's right. You don't have to miss a single minute of the book festival. No hard choices <laughs> this year. Just sit back and enjoy the whole thing. Yep. <laughs> 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, you guys. I appreciate you um, giving up so much of your time on a Friday afternoon. Um, and we will look forward to seeing you again on Monday the 19th. All righty. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Bye.